Good morning, everybody. My name is Mary Ann Skaparis, and together here this morning with my colleagues Linda Saunders, Jenny Burke, and Shirley Cunningham, we welcome you to the webinar Palliative Care Discovering All There Is to Know. So, I'd like to welcome our guest speakers here this morning who've um, come to share their knowledge uh, with us Professor Jennifer Phillip, Dr. Ralph McConaughey, and Dr. Carrie Lethborg, and Mrs. Jo Malone. So, I thank you all for joining us here today. I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. The Leukemia Foundation acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, some of you may be thinking, why are we holding this seminar? Well, what we know is, is that palliative care is not well understood in the community. Many pe people think it's about dying when actually it's more about living. It's often believed that palliative care is only provided at the end of life, but it's an approach that can be initiated when a serious illness is diagnosed and can be provided for many years. So in this webinar, we'll be discussing the role of palliative care and how it can help you live as well as possible with your blood cancer. Today, just to give you a little bit of sharing with you an outline for the webinar, we'll be hearing from three experts in the field who will be covering the role of palliative care and blood cancer management, the dispelling of the myths about palliative care, um, initiating the palliative care conversation, and finding meaning and purpose while living with a life-threatening illness. Importantly, uh, we will also be hearing from a wife and a carer who will share with us about their personal experiences with palliative care uh, to open up this webinar. I want to start by saying Peter was diagnosed with myelofibrosis in 2005. In 2014, he became transfusion dependent and over time this increased to two transfusions a week. By 2018, this was no longer sustainable due to progressive fibrosis. In 2019, Peter underwent a bone marrow transplant, knowing the success rate would be low. And by 2020, discussions started about a second bone marrow transplant. Yet before this could happen, Peter experienced two separate transformations in quick succession that changed everything. Peter and his wife Jo were having a different kind of conversation. In the time that I have worked with Jo, she's moved from thinking, I can't do this, to having a very different experience. So before Jo shares her story, I'd like to bring the essence of Peter into this conversation with us. Peter was a commanding officer in the Defence Forces for 27 years. He was kind, loved and respected, and his life was characterised by his integrity, dignity and resilience. He made his wife laugh every day. Peter died recently, aged 61, and it is my privilege to introduce you to Mrs Jo Malone, an identity important to her as a wife first and a caregiver second. And Jo will share some of her personal experience of how palliative care transformed that fear into a most special day. So thank you, Jo, for sharing with us. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, 10 weeks tomorrow, the love of my life passed away. And whilst I'm deeply, deeply sad, I'm also deeply grateful for the experiences that we had that led up to his death. As Jean said, we had a long journey to that point, but in um, January, February this year, Peter started to experience really um, terrible pain in his leg. And it took us quite some time for people to really understand what that pain was. So in March, um, he had, had an MRI, and two days later, we get a phone call to say that he had a 9.5 centimetre tumour in his tibia, and there was also um, lymph node involvement. So Pete went under, we immediately went under a number of tests um, and we went into um, our rooms, the consultant a few days later with great fear. Um, and the three of us, um, Peter, myself and our consultant got the results at the same time to say that um, the results were in and the myelofibrosis had transitioned to AML. 
because at that stage it was a surprise for us all. Um, our doctor said, look, he needed to consult with his colleagues and um, that they'd be in contact with us soon and to go home. Um, we did some talk about Peter's pain, but to be honest, um, nothing was touching it. And I can honestly say for three months we hadn't slept. So we went home and we waited. Um, so that we had that uh, meeting on the Tuesday, Wednesday came, Thursday came, Friday came. And at that stage, Peter started experiencing headaches. Um, so in the afternoon of Friday, we were going into the weekend that Peter was having terrible headaches. I rang our consultant and said um, that we needed, no one had been in contact with us. So he got back to us immediately. And he said, and I said, Peter's you know, pain's terrible. Um, nothing's touching it. And I, I think that's the hardest thing, two things, pain and fear. Um, one plays on top of the other, to be honest. So he rang us and said he was upset no one had been in contact with us either and we've decided that over on the Monday he would admit Peter for further testing at, at to the Royal Melbourne, which is where Peter had his transplant. So, but he did say at that point he was going to contact the palliative care team to give us a call that eve that afternoon to talk to us about Peter's pain and said, um, look, don't be afraid, palliative care is not about you know, end of life or anything like this. Is, these are the experts in pain management. So about an hour later, we got the phone call from most beautiful Naomi from Mac, our doctor. She was on the phone for us for about an hour, hour and a half, just chatting, getting to know us, getting to know me, getting to know Peter, getting to know what was important, and mostly getting her head around, trying to understand the pain that he's experiencing and now the headaches. So she talked about his pain management, organised um, changes in meds, rang our local um, pharmacist, spoke to him, got them to deliver over, <coughs> deliver a new uh, medication regime. And she gave us her contact details. And I can say for the first time in months and months, Peter and I exhaled because we felt safe and we felt heard and we felt seen. Over the weekend, um, Peter's uh, headaches again changed and he started to get um, the blurred vision. So on the Monday, um, I was sitting with him. He said to me, baby, come closer. I can't see you. And that was it. That was my trigger. I rang Jen being beside us for 18 months. And then I emailed Naomi. And within 18, in half an hour, um, Naomi rang me and she said, Joe, I've spoken to um, the hematology team. Bring Peter straight in. Accident, coming Sky, accident emergency. They're waiting. There's a bed up for you in 7B, which was wonderful because that's where he had his transplant. So I knew we were going into a safe space. And we did. So I took Peter straight in, and exactly that happened. We transitioned through um, triage through accident emergency. We were met by our most beautiful register, Cameron. And by this time, it's quite late in the afternoon, and Cameron said to us, Peter, I'm not going home until you're, you're safe. And you know, it's those tiny little words that mean the world. So Peter was admitted, we went to Save and Be, Peter was admitted, and over the next few days, we were introduced wholly to the whole Peter Mac, um, palliative care team because they were there to manage Peter's pain and to get to know us. So Pete went through a lot of testing and it was decision was made to have palliative um, radiotherapy on his leg, which was excruciating for you know, 48 hours, but it had a big impact. The test results were that Peter had um, a lesion on his brain and further testing that week. In the, in the meantime, we were having a lot to do with the palliative care team. And I have to say, when they were with us, they sat with us. And I mean that both physically and metaphorically, they just sat quietly in our space where, you know, you know the haematology team is very much about what's going on, what we need to do next. But every time palliative care came in, <clears throat> it was like exhaling. And we spoke, the results came back and um, Peter's AML had transitioned to extramedullary myeloid sarcoma. So he had multiple tumours. So the question at that stage was, well, what does that mean for us? And and I love, they, by now everyone knew we were pragmatic, very pragmatic when we wanted honesty, which everyone promised they would give us. And the answer at that stage is we really don't know. We don't know because it's such a rare type of transitional disease. 
So we said, well, what does treatment look like? So we discussed further treatment and the question we asked at that stage, well, what does it look like and to what end? So we further discussed that and having sat with our healthcare team and with, with the HEAM team, and Peter and I made the decision that we wanted to live his best life. And that was no more treatment. That was no more in and out of hospital because no one knew what time that meant for us. If it gave us two more months together, we wanted those two more. We didn't want those to be in hospital. We wanted to be out living what we could. So when we made that decision, there was, you knew there was an, an acceptance from everyone. And it was, you could sort of see the, the acceptance that we'd made that right decision for us. So as we said that, um, we had our healthcare doctors with us and they said, well, what can we do for you? And we said, well, and I sort of looked at Peter, I said, well, Peter wants to go to Queensland. And it's like this light came on in the room. It was like, <laughs> oh, really? He went, yeah, yeah, really? They said, let's make it happen. I said, I went, okay, you know, he's in a wheelchair, he's sighted, he's vision impaired, he's, he's, he's got aids and equipments, he's on 28 different types of drugs, I've got to get him on the plane, how the hell do I make this happen? He said, she said, no, 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 you don't make it happen, we all make it happen together. And that's what happened. So we got, to, within five days, we're in Queensland, we went to see um, his, two of his children had just moved up, we went to say goodbye to his friends, because he was in the Defence Force up there for many years. We ended up in hospital that night, the next day, because of all the planning that gone ahead, they already knew about us. We walked in, like they said, Brisbane, the Royal Brisbane said, had you arrived, we would have got into you, but because of what we were able to provide with, was what the Pal Care and HEM team had let, gave us. They said, he had made some adjustments to his dexamethasone and said, off you go, go live that life, go have that party on the Sunshine Coast, which we did. We came home. And the next morning, Pete had terrible pain in his back, and I thought it was from the plane trip. And in the morning, he woke up. He said, ring the ambulance. And he'd never said that to me before. So I did, and they came. And again, exactly the same. I rang Naomi and said, Naomi, this is what's going on. I rang um, him to 7B to say, Peter's on his way in. Again, they transitioned us straight through. We were straight up. We had further tests. And um, they told us at this stage that Peter had now, within three weeks, had developed a massive tumour in his abdomen, and he now had days to weeks to live. So now is our next question and our next, our next major decision was, what now? And what we knew, and what we, I always feared that, and we'd always, said, Peter said he never wanted me to do his personal care. And when that happened, he would either go into hospice or in palliative care or whatever, whatever that looked like. And I never thought I wanted him to die at home. But because of the support, the tools, the encouragement, <clears throat> the mantra that you've got this, we said, no, we don't want to stay here. We want to go home. And we did. And for three weeks, we were at home together. And every day Peter changed because of what was going on in his body. Every single day, every morning I got a call from the team. Every day I got a call from Naomi checking in, making sure we had to adjust his medication all the time. We had to adjust his aids and equipment. We had to adjust, he was getting cerebral irritation. So at night he was getting cranky at me and Peter never got cranky at me. I remember calling the team at 10 a.m. at night. He'd had a fall and he was grumpy. And, and they said, Joe, you've got this. And the next morning we woke up and I never mentioned to him that he was grumpy at me the night before and he never mentioned to me. We cope with his incontinence and we cope with everything because in the back we had our pal care team saying, we trust you, we believe in you, you've got this. And we did. I always thought the day Peter died would be the saddest day of my life. But it wasn't. The day he died was beautiful. The saddest day of our lives and my life has come every day since then. But I can honestly say the love and support we receive from our family and friends and the trust in the acknowledgement, the belief, the tools, the aids and equipment we receive from our palliative care team sustained us. 
and enable Peter to die in the manner in which he lived, in dignity and respect. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Joe. you. Thank you, Joe. That was very sensitive and 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 a beautiful and honest reflection of the lovely and lovely relationship that you shared. And what a gift that you gave to your husband, that connection and and how tremendous to hear that you felt so supported during that time. I'm sure it was difficult. Absolutely. I'm sure it was very difficult. And he gave me the gift to Marianne and trusting in me and so did the team. He trusted in us. That was the biggest thing. The trust and the belief they gave us that we could do it. In fact, my last words to him, I said, darling, we did it and you can go now. You use the words, the day that he passed was a beautiful day. And I guess the strength um, in saying that was reflecting that you gave him everything. You, you know, you, uh, the greatest gift that we can give to anybody really on this earth is love. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, that promise to be with him until the end and that opportunity to die in his own home surrounded by those that love him the most, that is a true gift. So and thank it's you. not something everyone can do, but for us, mm -hmm. it's something we could do. Absolutely. We could, we could do it. And it's not for everyone, but it was for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just wanting to introduce our next speaker for this morning. Thank you, Joe. Um, our next speaker is Professor, Professor Jennifer Phillip. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer Phillip is the chair of the Palliative Palliative Medicine University of Melbourne, St Vincent's Hospital and in collaboration with the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre and heads the Palliative Nexus Research Group. Jennifer is a palliative care clinician, researcher and teacher. Her focus, her research focus is on improving access and equity to high quality care for people with advanced illness increasing public awareness of options for care in this setting and improving the evidence-based underpinning symptom management. So thank you, Jennifer, for joining us here this morning. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Marianne. And um, can I just add also, thank you, Joe, for um, for sharing a bit of your life with Peter with us. And um, I guess for the honesty and the, the love and the relationship that you've shared with us this morning as well. Thank you. Um, and also really, um, in a way, you've made my task very easy because there's a lot that I don't need to say now. So, uh, you know, thank you for that. <laughs> um, also, thanks for the organisers and thanks for having me as part of this uh, really important event. I think it's great that um, I love talking about palliative care, but I'm also um, very mindful that there's a lot of things that people don't know about palliative care. And I guess I'm keen to sort of, I guess, try and fill in some of those gaps today. As I guess Joe's highlighted, um, when we ask people what's important when faced with serious illness, so pretty much across the world, people are fairly consistent in what they say. They say that they want to feel prepared for what is or what will happen, having a sense of knowing what to expect, having pain and symptoms controlled, knowing that their family is supported and um, informed and part of the part of the team, I guess. Um, within that team, also knowing that they're having open and, and full conversations and trusting conversations with their clinicians. An opportunity to achieve a sense of life well lived, completion. And many people, not everyone, but many people, if given the opportunity, would prefer to spend time at home and possibly even to die at home. And palliative care, I guess, that's what we do. Um, if this is from the Centre to Advance Palliative Care, but it's specialised medical care for people with serious illnesses. Focus on relief of symptoms and also of stresses and serious illness. And the goal is to improve quality of life for the patient. And I'm going to use the term patient, but um, I hope you'll forgive me. It's sort of shorthand, but um, I'm really talking about the person who is facing the illness and their family. So within this, I guess serious illness, but not necessarily 
um, and was highlighted at the beginning, not necessarily um, terminal illness. Um, relief of symptoms and pain and stress. Quality of life, both the patient and the family, knowing that people live as part of a community, we don't live in isolation. Um, and that it can be given or provided alongside usual treatment for the illness. So it's not an either or proposition. I just, I, I think it's worthwhile highlighting that it's not specific to a particular illness or a group of illnesses, not like cardiology is to the heart or um, respiratory is to the lungs. It's, um, it is more a philosophy or an approach to care um, and relevant for anyone who's really facing serious illness, wherever they may be, either in hospital or at home, um, as Joe's described, and at an illness stage, whenever they really have needs that palliative care might be able to help with. It explicitly recognises that we're more than an illness, but we know we, we have all the bits that we bring of ourselves um, when we have an illness and there are lots of those components that make us up. And all of those things need attention. So the goal of treatment is what the person nominates it to be. Um, we, we're talking about quality of life and all of us will have slightly different conceptions of what gives us quality of life. And so um, for me, it might be different. And these are the things that I would like palliative care to focus on for me. And you will only know if my palliative care is going well, if that's the thing that's assessed. So it's not about assessing disease parameters or a blood test. It's about how's that thing going that, that's causing me the most concern. And as said, the person and their family. So we work in partnership with the primary doctors, um, primary clinicians. We explicitly make time to have discussions with families and with, with patients. Communication is part of our toolkit, I guess, and we're interested in um, exploring, you know, what quality of life means, also what, what information people might need, what to expect, what are their goals, and how do we make sure that their care reflects these goals. We're expert managers of symptoms, um, physical, emotional symptoms. And we've said, I've already said, thinking about the whole person beyond the illness. Um, part of what we do, I think, which was described also by Joe so well, is this coordination of care, um, making sure that everyone knows who's doing what and what to expect. Linda shared this with me, which I hadn't actually seen, um, but I think it's quite a useful thing because it shows how the palliative care is the whole big bit and it can sit alongside chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, um, relevant for anyone with a, a serious illness. And then there are components of palliative care that might be relevant for some people at certain points. Um, so for people, if serious illness is, is much worse and, and um, treatments are um, either causing more burden or, or um, that um, indeed maybe treatments are less effective, then um, it may be that the person is looking more towards end of life. And then perhaps for some people, um, there's very explicit and more intense supports um, at the end stage of life or in terminal care. But palliative care is the whole big bit. And it can be concurrent. Um, so it really depends on what the issues are. So you can have your chemotherapy or radiotherapy alongside palliative care. And the sort of the relative balance might differ a little bit depending on what the problems are. Um, so I wanted to tell you just a little bit about um, uh, where you could ask, so is this relevant in, in blood cancer? And I guess um, I just wanted to tell you about a man who I was um, involved in the care of, um, and I'll call him Andrew, he's 46, husband of Jan and father of two boys, and he's a teacher and he loves potting, he's a potter. And this is his love, he talked, always talked about his passion of feeling the joy of having the clay on the wheel and being able to shape things into something. He was diagnosed with a, a large, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and was on treatment but, and it was going well, but he was having quite a lot of side effects in terms of nausea from his treatments. He'd had a number of medications tried and they hadn't been all that effective and he was still nauseated. He was pretty miserable with this. He wasn't really vomiting, but he was eating poorly. And above all, he couldn't really do this thing that he loved to do, which is potting. He couldn't concentrate. It was bothering him so much, he was actually thinking of changing his treatment or maybe even stopping. And at this point, he was referred to the palliative care clinic, which is where I met him. Um, 
we went through what had been tried and went through a series of things which could be contributing. And it seemed like there's possibly a few things going on. He was a bit constipated and that might have been a problem. There's a couple of other, and so we fixed that. And there was a couple of other things that he hadn't tried, which we began, a new tablet for his nausea, and also an antidepressant, which at, not so much for depression, but for um, appetite, which we know at low doses can be useful. Started to feel better. Saw him a couple more times. Things were going pretty well. He had talked about maybe trying cannabis, but because things were going pretty well, we decided to hold off for now. And he went back to his treatment and I said, well, you know, we don't need to see you regularly, but give us a hoy if there's any problems. So this was sort of a useful palliative care input. And we know that people with blood cancer do have symptoms. Um, in a snapshot of people attending a clinic or a haematology ward um, who had leukaemia, most of them were pretty recent in their diagnosis, less than a month or so. They had what they call a median, so sort of a bit like an average of nine physical and two psychological symptoms. And some of them were quite severe. You can see here that over half had difficulty sleeping and it was severe in 44%. 36% um, were feeling sad and it was severe in 22%. Lack of energy, almost everyone, 80, almost 80% 80 had a lack of energy and it was severe in over half. So you can see that symptom burden is not an insignificant thing for people with blood cancer. And this is an area that palliative care can be useful. And it works. Um, again, from the US Centre to Advance Palliative Care, we know that it improves quality of life and symptom burden. Um, it reduces distress. And the improvement seemed to last for some months after a consultation. And people feel more satisfied and they're much more likely, or they're likely to recommend it if they've had palliative care. So 93% are likely to recommend it to others. So people think it's pretty useful. I wanted to show you this because this was sort of a landmark study that came out about 10 years ago. It was in lung cancer. Um, so a bit different, but people who entered the study were randomised, so by chance, they were put into two groups. Either they had their usual cancer care, so all the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, etc., or they had their usual cancer care, so exactly the same, plus regular palliative care input. And what they found when they analysed the results is that the people who received this early palliative care had better quality of life, less anxiety and depression, fewer trips to the emergency department and fewer hospital admissions. And what was made at such a big sort of talking point in the medical fraternity is that they actually lived longer. So palliative care made people feel better and in this study, it made them live longer. This same sort of methodology was um, repeated for um, a study of people who underwent, who had blood cancers, a variety of blood cancers, who underwent a stem cell transplant. So there are 160 people, and again, they were randomised to receive all the usual standard care of all the, the things that you have when you have a transplant, or all of that plus palliative care. And the palliative care, they met them within three days of their admission, and they saw them a minimum of twice a week. And they spent time establishing a relationship with the patient and family, managing symptoms and coaching, I guess, in, in strategies to cope with, with stress and distress. On average, there were eight of these visits. Um, on average, the patient stayed 20 days. Everyone, as consistent with the um, blood transplant, after about two weeks, that's when a lot of the side effects of the, um, of the chemotherapy, et cetera, kicks in. And everyone's quality of life went down at that two week point. But those who had palliative care wasn't down nearly as far. So theirs was better than the, than the standard care group. And they were also better in their quality of life at three months or 12 weeks. They had less depression and anxiety throughout, and they had longer, they had fewer longer-term stress symptoms as a as a result of from the transplant at 12 weeks. So there's now been lots of these studies, and they pretty much show that there are person patient benefits, reduced symptoms, getting more information and greater understanding of the illness, and perhaps as a result of that, more involvement in decision making and greater likelihood of their care and their preferences for their decisions being matched, um, particularly towards the end of life, and more satisfied. Similarly, families are more satisfied, better mood, um, 
And for those families of people who die, better outcomes in their bereavement. And there are benefits for the health services as well. Um, it helps the health services if the care and the preferences for care match, um, more planning and more likelihood of death at home for those people who would prefer to do so. So that, I think this is sort of, it's busy, but bear with me. I think it's a useful sort of thing. So if you have timely palliative care, you get timely symptom management, um, which means that you can go on with your, um, with your cancer treatments. Uh, maybe fewer symptom crises um, and so greater satisfaction. If you have timely palliative care, you get better or longitudinal over time psychosocial support, um, which might reduce your anxiety and depression, um, attention to spiritual care and enhance trusts and relationships. And then there's the communication benefits as well. So I think this is potentially an, an attempt to sort of explain why some of these outcomes are available for people. So this whole list was sort of very good news for those of us who work in palliative care. It felt like these sort of studies would be transformational and this would be a new dawning for palliative care and that everyone would be lining up for it and this is what we should be doing. But we know that actually there are still some gaps. This is an older study that we did um, in Victoria, but um, examining the access to palliative care over six months for people with um, lymphoma. And we found that a bit over half didn't have a palliative care referral. For those who did, it happened quite late, about three weeks before the, before the, um, before the person died. And for 80%, it happened in the final admission to hospital. So it was sort of happening for a number of people, but not until quite late. So you just sort of wonder whether some of those benefits are able to be fully realised if that's the case. And I might just skip over this because it says the same thing and just in the interest of time. So why not? What are the roadblocks to this? Um, I think there is an issue about when. People always wonder when's the right time in palliative care. And we know that intensive treatments often hold a real chance of cure, even in advanced illness in blood cancers. And at the same time, these treatments can risk poor outcomes, both in terms of side effects and and if they're not so effective, then that's a, also a poor outcome. This fellow, Thomas LeBlanc, who's a um, haematologist and a palliative care physician from America, he said we need to upstream the integration of palliative care and just do it as a matter of routine, not rely on prognosis and just recognising that generally earlier is better. It increases the options for care, increases the likelihood of preferences being on the table, and it also increases the exposure to the better symptom control, et cetera, or the expertise in symptom control. So who needs it? Well, this is a whole big um, list again from that same fellow, LeBlanc. But he says, if you've got a high symptom burden, if you're having a transplant, if there's distress or difficulty coping, complex family or social needs, perhaps if there's a sort of um, misunderstandings or misperceptions about the illness, um, and perhaps if they're, if in the setting where a prognosis is poorer, then all these people may well benefit from palliative care. This comes from um, an international group who got together and said, OK, who should be having palliative care? And they came up with a consensus of criteria of when or who should be referred for palliative care. And I've just pulled out those that are relevant for people with blood cancers. Um, if physical symptoms or emotional symptoms are severe, if there's spiritual or existential concerns or crisis, um, persistence with decision making, if certainly if the person requests the referral, if confusion or what we call delirium is a problem, and for those people who have um, brain or, or spinal cord disease might well benefit from palliative care. But we know that there are a series of, of thoughts and misunderstandings and misconceptions about palliative care, which means that um, a number of people feel worried and, and might resist this idea. And these are some quotes from some studies that we've done. Um, and this is a variety of different people with, with serious illness. But one notion is that palliative care means the end. And someone said, it's what you have at the end, you know, the last few hours. There's a, a lack of knowledge that it's a specialised care. I thought palliative care was very basic, just a bed in a hospital. 
people are concerned that it means giving up hope and from this person a lot of people don't see palliative care as a treatment option i think a lot of the other therapies and medicines and things like that they see as a hope whereas palliative care is not hope and then this is always this sort of um you know, if you don't say it, then it might not happen. Don't say the word. Um, okay. So it sort of seems that palliative care means you're dying. And it feels like if you don't say it, it might not happen. And clinicians also, some clinicians hold these mi misconceptions. Um, palliative care is not necessarily prioritised in the same way as some of the other treatments. So from this oncologist, it will mean changing the mindset so that palliative care is prioritised at the highest level, as is chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Some clinicians think that patients might misconstrue this as, as thinking that I'm giving up or destroying hope. And this is very much based on a view that only if there's no remaining treatment options. But we know that modern palliative care should be an adjunct to disease-directed therapy. It's not an either or. Palliative care can help people to live better while they have treatments um, and also while they're negotiating or thinking about treatment decisions. So what's the way forward? Um, people with blood cancer, we know that they have particular needs. We also know that we have a therapy or an approach that works is palliative care. Um, so how do we manage these sort of misconceptions, this worry about hope, worry about giving up and ensure it's available to everyone who needs? And at the same time, honour the relationships and treatments um, that have been, play, been in place and often exist over many years. So we sort of need to transform this. How do we make it happen? How do we make this approach available and make it safe? So I would contend that we need to make this routine. We need to embed palliative care in usual haematology care. This will ensure that there are seamless trusted relationships between the clinicians and seamless um, relationships of care for patients and families. It also is consistent and fits into usual care so that it, you know, for example, in an outpatient clinic or going on rounds together. I think it should be introduced at a regular point and just available as part of the best approach to care. This is just what we do as high quality care rather than something special or different or, you know, this person's been singled out. I think when we're introducing it, we talk about the activities and the goals of palliative care because we know that people think that they are valuable and they want some of those even though the name palliative care worries them and we should focus on and highlight the patient and family centered priorities so just to um, tell you about we're actually doing a study where we're trying to do this at the moment the care plus study which is across a number of sites we are implementing early palliative care as part of routine care best quality care for people with cancer, with a variety of cancers, including some blood cancers. Um, and our aim is to do this, just to make it part of what we do, a practice change. Um, and just and then I guess what we're doing, um, particularly with we're focusing on um, people with myeloma, um, some lymphoma groups, and also some leukemia groups. Um, people who have a particular point in their illness, then everyone just gets palliative care built into their system. And the outcomes that we're interested in is the experiences, also how you do this in a, in a system, how do you implement this and what do you need to do to make the system change to sort of adopt this modern approach to palliative care and we're interested in health services. So that's, I guess, just for your interest. So just getting back to Andrew, I did see him, he did come back to clinic. His cancer had come back and he had been accessing him for clinical trials, so he'd moved his Cancer Treatment Centre. Um, his scans and his numbers were quite good, but he was feeling increasingly uneasy and distressed. And he asked to see the PAL care team. And his um, haematologist um, said, "Oh no, no, I don't. You don't need. You don't need to do that." And Andrew said, "Oh no, I think I, I think it would be helpful." And so they said, "Oh, okay." So he educated his haematologist, and the haematologist re referred him to clinic. Um, and it was clear that things were going quite well. His symptoms were fine. And his numbers were good, but he had a sort of an urgent sense of need to talk about his future, including the possibility of a future where he may not be there. And we had over a couple of consultations, some quite sort of moving and difficult conversations where he really explored what was on his mind. Um, he, 
he was interested in um, thinking about what would he be hoping for if things went well and also if things didn't go so well. What would be important to his life and to the lives of those people that he loved. And he sort of decided a couple of things. Um, and he was, as I said, he was doing well in his treatments and things, but he thought he wanted to hold a public exhibition of his pottery. Remember, he, this was his love. This is what he was passionate about. And this was partly to put a stamp on the world, you know, his, his thing, and also an opportunity to bring together, invite all those people in his life who he loved and to come together and celebrate something creative. And the other thing that he wanted to do was to create a series of pots that represented different aspects of his life for his sons, a sort of a narrative of their lives together and, a, and an act of love for them. And so this is what he really spent um, time on over the next few months, working through both these things that he'd set himself. And this was enormously fulfilling for himself, for him and for his family. It was important and it was very life affirming. He held his exhibition about nine months ago and I'm happy to say Andrew's, you know, doing well and he's living well still. So what can people do? Well, you can ask for help. Don't worry about who might help, just ensure that you're getting it and that you're getting the access to the best care. I think if something's bothering you, then bring it up. It's important. If it's bothering you, then, you know, value it, raise it and um, share it with your clinical teams. Also value and involve those people around you, those people who you love. Um, conversations are important um, and conversations with the people you love and also with your clinical team. And often you can have these conversations and then they're sort of done and you can put them aside and this can be quite a relief as well. So to conclude, palliative care can be helpful. It can be delivered alongside blood cancer treatments. There are some challenges that we're still you know, needing to navigate about making sure that it's available as a part of routine care for everyone who needs it. Um, building it into standardised best care and embedding in usual care, I think, is a way forward because it addresses some of these gaps. The timing, the who, it ensures it's equitable, it builds confidence in the relationship. And I think that the future that we need to do in palliative care is do this public awareness raising just to, to change the understanding and to build a much more um, um, informed conversation around this area of care. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what a valuable session. And I loved how you smiled all, you know, all the way through it. I think that's very important in this virtual world to see a beautiful facial expression. So thank you for spending time. I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Jenny, Jenny Burke. Uh, she's going to be um, addressing the questions that we have in the chat. Jen, thank you so much. I think from the questions and the comments, it's clear that you've touched on a very valid relevant thing for a lot of people so one of the questions that i think is really important is you know we know that there are clinician barriers to having these discussions so how would you suggest a family raise this with their clinician if it hasn't already been brought into discussion or it's something they'd like to explore sure thanks jenny and um it might be the ralph talks about this a bit more later as well but i think so. um i think that as I said, if something's bothering you, then bring it up. And if it's yeah, not addressed, yeah. then bring it up again. And um, <laughs> and I think, I think so clinicians are, are frightened of upsetting people and they don't want to bring things up. They, as I said, they're worried that they don't want to destroy hope or upset people. Um, but I think that if the person themselves says, look, I've heard about this and I want some of it, then the clinician will broadly um, be responsive. And if not, then um, I think I noticed briefly in the chat that, in fact, Eugene said that they, that people could potentially contact the Leukaemia Foundation and there may be some opportunities to advocate on behalf of them. But I think if something's bothering you, just bring it up and, and the clinicians will generally follow, follow where you want to lead. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. I think the other thing that became really clear to me, listening to both you and Joe, is that you know, both the research and the personal experience just shows how valuable palliative care is and that it's an it's an adjunct, it, it's a value add service. It's not an either or scenario. Um, and one of the questions that's come up is around the fear of the unknown. How, how would you suggest 
um, people can start to address those fears or what do you see as some of the common fears that people worry about and want to talk about yet don't want to sort of raise? It's that real conundrum. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. I think um, so fears are fears and sometimes you don't even really know what they are until you start to speak them. Um, mm. I think um, people have you know, lots of different fears and there are some ones that commonly come up um, and some of those are fears around you know what will this look like and um, for people who are facing the end of life what will my dying look like um, sometimes it's fears of pain or sometimes it's fears of a symptom um, sometimes it's fears of um, um, of losing dependence or needing to rely on others for more care. Um, I think, I mean, all of these are fears and they are, you know, eminently justifiable. And, um, and I think, you know, some of them can be assuaged or, you know, can be talked through what might be able to be put in place. And some of them being spoken and sharing them with someone is, you know, perhaps the most, the important act. Um, yeah. So I think um, I think again exploring them with someone is the first step, and then um, and sometimes just as I said, speaking them can be a helpful act in and of itself. And I imagine, yeah. and I don't want to, but I imagine Ralph might well talk about this more eloquently than I. <laughs> I think you're very eloquent. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your gentle beautiful wisdom and compassion with us i feel we're very lucky to have had you i know you have to scoot off at 11 and i'm, I'm very conscious of the time so what i think we might do is continue moving along and if there are any other questions we'll give people a chance at the end to discuss that with any of the rest of us thank, thank you Jen. You. yeah thank you jennifer um, our next speaker I'd like to welcome is Ralph McConaughey. Uh, Ralph is a specialist in palliative medicine and has been the medical director of the Wesley, Wesley Hospital Palliative Care Service since 2007. He is a senior lecturer in medicine at the University of Queensland Medical School. Uh, the Wesley Hospital in Brisbane is the largest private hospital in Queensland and has a 20 bed haematology ward and a 12 bed bone marrow transplant unit. It is one of the very few private hospitals in the nation with the dedicated palliative care services with a ward of 17 beds along with an active consultation liaison service. Ralph's interests are focused on patient care with a particular concern for the management of complex pain and to promote understanding of the profound effects advanced disease has upon patients and on those who love and care for them. So thank you Ralph for uh, joining us here today and I'll hand hand it over to you. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's quite an honour to sit here. I'm very grateful for being asked to participate in what's a very important meeting and I'm very grateful to those who've spoken before me. I think everyone's been eloquent and honest and um, it's quite a challenge sitting here, I have to say. And, and I suppose I was reflecting on some of what Jennifer had said about how effective palliative care is. And I think I totally agree, of course. Um, but, but I guess you've also got to think, well, why does palliative care exist? What happened to our medical system that we have had to develop a specialty where we listen and where we communicate and where we attend to suffering? Surely that's what every doctor and nurse and uh, allied health provider should do with every patient. And it's one of the difficulties. And I think particularly in haematology, um, communication is really important, but it's hard to obtain sometimes. And I guess the way to think of it is that um, in haematology, what's happened over time, over decades, is really we reduce the problem to its minor components. And so when you talk to a haematologist, He'll know about the DNA profile of your kind of disease. He'll know about, you know, the different white cells and which ones are winning and losing and 
what your platelets are doing, what your hemoglobin is doing. And he'll know what your cancer looks like when he looks down a microscope, because most of them maintain a role in the pathology lab as much as in the clinical ward. So when they meet you, what they carry sometimes in their mind is the image of your cancer in, in a slide or as a result of a bone marrow aspiration. And what the danger is that you can be reduced to being that slide, not intentionally, but it's the nature of practice. At the same time, reducing um, your illness to those tiny, tiny parts help doctors understand and help us develop treatment that actually works. So you benefit from the reduction of this disease to its minor points, but you suffer at the same time. And I think the suffering is we lose sight of you as people and as human beings. And really that's why palliative care developed. And it really in modern terms only established itself in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And in Australia, it wasn't really recognized as a specialty at all until 2000. So in terms of uh, its position in medicine, it's, it's, it's a newborn, it's very recent, but it's drawn, brought out of this need to recognize patients as people and to recognize you as human beings and to meet you as equals. And, and I think that's a really key factor of what palliative care does for people and what it can particularly do for those who are suffering from a blood related cancer. And you'll have to forgive phones ringing in the background that life going on. Um, so from that point of view, um, it can be really quite difficult to establish good conversations with the people who provide care for you in hematology um, because it's focused on those small points and the human being aspect is a little bit more peripheral. And so I hope that that's what we can bring back into the equation. So in that sense, and inviting palliative care in, I hope opens the horizons for patients and families and broadens the picture rather than, um, you know, is a negative experience, which I think is a lot of what Jennifer was able to help us appreciate. So in part, I guess, what can you expect if you're going to meet a palliative care specialist? Um, how does that work? And, and you've already had a pretty good background to that, especially from Joe's eloquent and moving talk about her experience and her families. And I think too, from what Jennifer's said, so part of it, I think, is we have to recognize you as people. So I think one of those things is stopping. And, and I think as Joe said, you know, it's easy to come into a, a ward or to a patient at the bedside or even in an office, and you get the feeling maybe I'm not really the center of attention and maybe there's something else going on in this person's mind who's not fully engaged with who I am. And I think very often just moving your chair out from behind the desk and sit beside someone in your consultation room or getting a chair and sitting at the bedside um, so that your eyes are level with your patient's eyes um, so that you're close. It sends a message and the message is I'm stopping and I'm here to focus on you and I'm here to listen and hopefully communicate with you. So I think how we enter this and how we show um, our enthusiasm for interaction makes a big port, uh, a big point. And sometimes that's what all people need on occasions is to think, oh, someone's paid attention and finally heard what I've been saying for three months or six months or 12 months on occasion. So I think that's a really important part. Um, I think the other thing in coming to meet someone as a palliative care specialist is we're pretty scary. And um, even today I had my horns trimmed nicely and I've had my tail removed so that none of you will see <laughs> the Satan-like appearance that I normally bear. Um, because I think that's very often the image, isn't it? That, um, that we are the people who bring death and that when we enter a room, you know, we maybe have a big black cloak that we can sweep across our shoulders and a maniacal laugh. 
And I know that's a cartoon sort of appearance, but people carry that anxiety within them. So part of our job, I think, is to also allay fear of, of what we can do. And Jennifer's really laid out beautifully what we do do and how much we can help. But I think it's important to um, convey that in a very clear way to our patients. And so there are some things I think that can be surprising for patients. Sometimes they don't know we're coming. And it's different if you're making an appointment to see a palliative care specialist in an outpatient clinic. But on occasion, what happens is, of course, you're sick in hospital. And as Jennifer said in those statistics, most palliative care referrals happen in the last admission uh, before life ends. So a lot of the time, we're going to be coming to you rather than you coming to us. Um, and sometimes you don't know we're coming. And that's pretty scary. We're, we'll just walk in, another jolly doctor coming to make my life miserable. And then you find out that it's a palliative care specialist and no one actually told you we were, were coming. And that can be pretty frightening. And I think people assume that you're coming to bring the bad news that other doctors can't give because your other doctors can't bear to tell you that you know, negative part of their treatment. And so it's important to say, I'm not here for another agenda and I'm not here to do something um, that the others are too afraid to do, but I'm here because they asked us to come because we can bring benefit to your care. We can improve things for you. And I think people sometimes worry, um, why are you here now? You know, what's happened to me that suddenly I've got a, a palliative care specialist, a doctor who deals with dying sitting by my bedside. You know? and, and I think it's really important from us to ask, well, what is it that you understand about your disease? What do you know about your condition? What have you and your doctor discussed? And sometimes the difficulty can be when I've spoken to the referring hematologist um, and they'll say, oh, it's X, Y, or Z. And you talk to the patient and it's A, B, and C. And the two are very different. And you can see sometimes the, the communication where the doctor will think, yes, I've told my patient what's going on. And the patient thinking, oh, I'm doing fabulously. And it's miles apart. And I think it was George, George Bernard Shaw. Now, I don't want people to think I read Irish literature and plays, but he did say um, the biggest illusion about communication is that we think it's taken place. And I think that's one of our biggest problems is you can walk out of a room and think, well, I've explained that really well. And the person in the room goes, I really don't understand what just happened. So part of it is being able to explain things very clearly if we can. And I think much as Jennifer had said, what I'd like to explain to patients is that uh, broadly, I think we bring three roles when we come to be with you or when you come to visit us. I think the dominant thing is we manage symptoms. And that's what Jennifer made plain um, and Joe did too, because of the difference it made in her husband's life is that our expertise is managing problems like pain and it's managing things like nausea that won't go away or, you know, even some mundane things like constipation, which is so distressing for some people, they'd sooner not take pain relief than deal with the resultant constipation. So we have to be good at those things. I think the second component is that we're really good at getting people out of hospital. And I think for hematology patients especially, that's important you hear that because hematology is a, a day hospital event or it's an inpatient event. It's intense and it's tough and it's never ending, it seems sometimes. But we can get you home. And that's an important part, particularly as disease progresses, that being home is something people want. And Coming from Queensland, it's a big state, and we have patients in my hospital who come from Cairns in far north Queensland or far western Queensland because this is a centre of expertise. But people's heart is in Billawheela or it's in Townsville or it's in Mount Isa. They don't want to be in Brisbane. But often the treating specialist says, well, you can't get the care there. I'm keeping you because I can give you better care here. But people need to know they can go home. And that's one of the things we can do. And if we get you home, one of the things we can do is coordinate so that care at home works for you. 
So you have the right people, the right equipment, the right medication, and the right ways of communication and staying connected. The third thing we do is the thing everyone worries about. We care for people at the end of life. And I think that's the immediate assumption is, oh, well, that's it, I've had it, you're here, I'm done for. And, and it's that element of realizing that's actually a small part of what we do. It's about 30% of my job and 70% is those other things that I've mentioned. So we really cover a range and I think it's important that we share that and communicate it well to the people that we're going to be involved with. So I guess the other part of, of communicating is, um, is who we're talking to. And part of that is the person, the patient, feeling they've got the right people in the room. And I think that aspect to that is if you're having an important conversation, you've got painkillers, you've got drugs, you've got antibiotics, you've got a fever, you feel terrible. It's hard to remember stuff. And it's hard to take away messages that we might think are important, um, might get lost in the process. So I think very often it's important to know that you can have others with you. And that doesn't matter where you are, even if you're in a laminar flow room in the bone marrow transplant unit, you don't have to be alone. And the people who love you can be with you as much as we can. And so they're often thinking more clearly and remembering better. So an important part of communication is, is having the right people there. And so sometimes it's important for us to defer conversations and maybe not say everything to that person who's suffering, but wait till the right team is there and the right people are there to share that information with. Which also means we get much trickier questions. So that's the downside of having you know, others in the room. They might ask things that are difficult and of course we'd prefer to avoid that. Um, I think the other things are in those times where we're trying to share is you don't want interruptions. Um, any more than I didn't want my phone to ring or my dog to bark, which you probably can't hear. Um, I, I don't want the cleaning lady coming into your room in the hospital or um, you know, other people interrupting what can be sometimes a very intense conversation. So it's important to be sure there's privacy and there's time. And so that's what we would make an effort to ensure. You know, it doesn't always work and you get all manner of people wandering in and out. But as much as possible, it's trying to have that set so that we have quietness and as few interruptions as possible and the most important people are there. And I suppose other aspects to that which sort of bridge into other things are really thinking about family and friends and having them engaged. They are as likely as scared or as anxious about a palliative care doctor being involved in the conversation as patients are. In fact, sometimes more so. And sometimes to the point where it's almost though the people who love that, that particular person want to run interference want to block difficult questions, want to prevent too much emotion being shared, want to avoid some of the stark realities of the situation. And so communication between the patient and loved ones is also really important because without uh, perhaps a consent from the patient um, saying it's all right, these are things I want to talk about, Sometimes it can be quite limited simply out of people being well-meaning and kind and sometimes being afraid for themselves, that they're afraid to share those things. So um, part of it, I think, is, is having not just good com communication with doctors and nurses and physios and speech pathologists and dieticians and all the other people, but it's communication with the people you love. And as an aside, I keep saying patient and it's really annoying me and I hope you'll forgive me. It's just medical shorthand, isn't it? It's, it's for the person who's sick. But it's really important for every clinician um, and that's shorthand for doctors and physios and everyone else um, to be thinking about the patient. You know? And I suppose one of the things as a person I like to do when I write notes about the patients I meet each day is I'm sure that I write their name down when I make notes in the file or when I type, I put 
the person's name because what you see it, it always is shorthand capital p with a circle around it or just p on its own or something that shorthands that but it reduces the human being one step further because we don't use their name and i think small things like that that says you are valued we think about you as a person makes a huge difference and so i keep rattling on about patience and i'm saying it for expediency but one of the key things i think in that role of communication is to be able to say you know you are you and i recognize you i stop and i sit with you and i want to talk and understand where you're at as much as i want to give you morphine or whatever else it might be i want to do that too but i want to meet the human being i think that's a really important part and to meet the people you love and i think communicate equally with them so that they're just as aware of what um, what's transpiring and make sure that they're aware that we don't come to talk you out of treatment we don't come to criticize your physicians caring for you we don't come with an agenda of our own we come to listen and we come to go from that meeting with an understanding of what your agenda is what it is you wish and sometimes part of that agenda is helping to educate you and your family because sometimes what you wish may not really ever happen and sometimes it may be i want to go back to boogie boarding at the coast you know but you know your myeloma is going to give you 12 fractures in your backbone if you do that so sometimes we have to think about what's real versus what i'd love and it's helping people to distill down what can we really achieve against what would be my greatest wish so helping people to sort of bring things down to a real identifiable wish what is it i desire and for sometimes that's cure and sometimes it's doable and we say yes we'll we'll go with you and we'll will support you and assist you and control your symptoms as you strive for cure but for others cure is not going to happen and i think part of it is gently and in time and respectfully help people appreciate that that's where they're at that maybe cure won't eventuate and it's then helping to make hope real still we don't steal hope i don't stuff it in the bag and take it outside with me um, but help to change hope so that hope is real and maybe that hope is for more time. Maybe that hope is for a better communication with the people you love. Maybe that hope is to go to the Gulf Coast, is to be in Queensland. Uh, there's many, many things, but hope never disappears. It just changes in its nature, but it never goes. And part of our role is to make sure hope stays vital and alive. And, and I guess that's the direction I'd like our conversations to take so I've banged on a lot about that i think the the other side of it is with I, I, what i've ignored is your other specialists and your other team members who care for you as patients and i think hematology is particularly difficult it's a it's a you know it's a bit like intensive care and it's a period, sometimes it is intensive care so you've actually noticed but it's sort of a feeling of well yes you're suffering but you should suffer look what we're doing to you we're nuking your bone marrow we're we're sticking you with needles we're giving you all these high-powered drugs of, of course you're going to feel difficult and miserable um and sometimes it's sort of just accepted that suffering is part of the deal and and you buy into that thing of okay i've got to grit my teeth and get through this but I guess one of the jobs that palliative care can do is to ease that suffering, both emotionally and physically. But part of that is getting your haematologist to invite us to the party. And it's not a great party sometimes, is it? But, but we need an invitation. And so that part is, is how do you start conversations with your doctors that might result in having access to some of the things I hope we've been able to show you work really well. And it's difficult as jennifer alluded to i think hematologists a lot still think of palliative care as what we do at the very end and um you better come today because i think bob's going to die and it might be this afternoon and we get referrals like that which make me sad mm -hmm. um 
But equally so, I, I love the guys who say, look, this is a long process. We're going to be doing this for a couple of years or more before we get a cure or we get a good outcome. Can you come and walk with this person and your team walk with them? And, and that's really what I love. So how do you bring your hematologist around? How do you put a bridle and reins on them? And, and really, that's quite difficult. Um, and I think part of it is, is the communication you have with your loved ones, because you have people who will fight for you and they'll you know, wade through um, mud up to their waist if they have to, to do whatever they can for you. So part of it is agreeing as a team of you and the people who love you that this is something you wish or desire and make that plain. And sometimes that's all that's required. Every hematologist knows which family member is the one to hide from, right? The one who's really come with the list and the jobs and wants things done. That's the person to get to speak for you. I think that's very helpful. Um, hematologists, they're lovely people. They've got good hearts. They want you to get well but they worry if they say palliative care that they'll think you're feeling they don't have hope for you anymore. Um, and sometimes you've got to tell them that. You've got to tell them, I know you hope for me to get better and I know you want me to do well and I know this next treatment's going to be good, but could you engage these people because I think they will help me cope with what's happening better. And I think if you pitch it at that level, I think oftentimes um, you know, that works better. But it also works better to have clear goals because as doctors, what we um, assume is that we know what's best for you. And, you know, most of the time we're right, you all know that. Um, we're magic, but it's the sense that if we know a lot about palliative care or a lot about hematology, we know a lot about you as a human being. And that's not true. The people who know about you are you and the people who love you. And you are the ones who set the goals. And part of our job is to help those goals be spoken and to let the specialist treating you understand what those goals are. And, you know, I look after many young people, sadly, and who are 18, 19, 20. And, you know, the hematologists would say, well, this person's goal is to live a full life. And I say, no, it's not their goal. It's to take their sister to the school formal on Friday night next week. That's all they want. They don't need excoriating treatment, they just need the time to do that. And so as families, if you're able to define your goals and be able to talk to your hematologist to say, this is what I'm hoping for, this is what I'm wanting, then it's easier then for hematologists to have that palliative care discussion, to make that referral, if they understand what it is that you want. The same comes with wanting to be at home, because that's a big deal. And sometimes our job is to negotiate with the, the hematologist on your behalf so that we can work out a way to get you home. Because very often their view is best care is here, best place you can be is in this bed, in this transplant unit, and so I want to keep you. And so we have to work around that. So I hope that's giving you some ideas about how best we can use communication to help I think if you're stuck, um, then things like um, referring back to organisations like Leukemia Foundation say, oh, it's a bit difficult. We really want something. We can't get where we're going. Then there are other avenues, other ways around that. Um, and we can work together, maybe not so um, clearly as a team, but it's certainly still achievable. Um, I think the other thing in thinking about communication is trying to be pretty frank. And, and I think that's difficult. When you talk to most adults, um, they want the truth. Not everybody does. And I think that's also important for some people to hear, yes, your life will end and we think it might end soon, is terribly, terribly hard. Most of us want to know, but some don't. And I think, again, as a as a family team or as a support team, it's important to tell us that at the outset, say, you know, I want what you can bring, but maybe don't talk to me about this aspect because I find that too distressing. And, and we just put that aside. And there may come a time when, and they'll say, you know, I didn't think I wanted to talk about that, but now I feel 
you understand me and we can have that conversation. So can I ask you about X, Y, and Z? So I think that's a important part. We move at the pace that you want as the, the patients. Um, so the communication has to be two ways. Tell us what you don't want to know. Tell us how you want us to communicate with you, what information you would like and what you would like us to put to one side. I think I always try to tell people that I'm honest and that I wouldn't not tell them the truth unless they really, really tell me, don't speak about a certain aspect. But it's to do it in a kind way and a gentle way. And, and I've got you know some frightful dad jokes, which I think are terribly useful on occasions. <laughs> so I think humour happens till the minute life ends and, and everybody's alive till the second that they're not. And part of that is living rather than dying. And that includes enjoying humour, enjoying love, enjoying the people who are around you. Um, it's not over till it's over. It's important to, to live as a full person for all that time if we can. And some of that is actually saying difficult words and, and spit them out. And once you've said it, they don't hold power over you. They don't any longer wrap you in fear. And saying, am I going to die, as frankly as that, is a good thing. Or will you tell me if I'm dying? And say the word dying. And I'm sorry, I hope I don't cause offence by saying that now. But it's a lot better than saying, you know, Bob's past. Because I often think, driver's licence? Or did he pass an exam? In hospital? Did he do a poo? You know, <laughs> these are the things we think about. And he's dead, he's died. The word is just a word. It holds no power. And... Don't let it bind you up and, and, and wrap you in fear. If you speak those things, they vanish. And I think that's a really important part of it all. And maybe I suspect it's time I stopped and uh, gave people opportunity to ask questions or simply um, move forward from there. So thank you for the opportunity. Though. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you for spending time um, with us here this morning. Um, the value of open conversations and, you know, I picked out a whole heap of little golden nuggets as I'm sure many others did too. Um, I'll just hand over to Jenny Burke, um, who's been keeping a sharp eye on the chat just to um, <laughs> relay to you any questions that have come through that, come through there. Thanks. Um, Ralph, it's, it's brilliant that you talk about people advocating for themselves and and being clear and defining their goals. I think some of the questions relate to, you know, how do you how do you have that conversation for the first time? Is it with families? Is it with the patient? Is it with them all together? How do you even start that conversation and, and start to articulate, as you said, think these things out loud and um, help people identify what those words are that they're looking for? Yeah, it, it, I, I think part of it is. Um actually finding out what a patient wants, really. Do they want just the two of us talking or would they like someone with them? Um, and maybe sometimes deferring conversation until the right people are in the room. I, I guess part, I, what I didn't say is these visits from palliative care doctors are really, they're endless and they go on for a long time. So uh, if I meet someone the first time, I might be there for an hour and a half or two hours. It can be a long process. What I like to ask about is who they are as people. And in that, I also ask people, do they have a, a, are they spiritual? What's the aspect of life that gives their spirit strength? Because that's such an important part of how we deal with things. And I think what I encourage people to do is to think about what makes them strong, what helps them prepare for adversity, what are they going to call on? And often to then to think about, well, if my life were to come to an end, how would I want that to be conducted? How would I like things to be? So sometimes it, it's starting to talk or think about, I haven't done my will, or gee, I better organise a power of attorney given that I'm very sick. And sometimes they're ways of allowing the conversation to broaden. And I think it's always good for the first conversation to happen between patients and the people who love them if it's possible, but if not, then that's something I'm really keen to facilitate. But sometimes the easiest way into that difficult area of, of what happens to us as the people and what happens to us as we die, sometimes it's best access to talking to family about things like organising a will 
or doing practical legal things and then starting to think about have you heard about advanced health directives do you know about maybe making a statement of choices how you want to be treated while you're in hospital or with your care and from there thinking well if i don't want to go to intensive care or i don't want you know resuscitation and cardiac message what what do i want what do i replace that with you know i can think of a young lady who wanted her best friend to play the cello by her bed and that's what she wanted instead of more antibiotics but we're not going to get to that to find that without a conversation that takes us into that area and so often yeah. i think it's using those things like advanced care plans and advanced health directives and conversations around the legal technicalities which most adults know they've got to do it's not such a threatening aspect of conversation lets us explore that area a little bit better i'm not sure if i answered the question in the end um, I think you did a beautiful job. It, it encompassed actually a few of the other questions that have been going on. I think, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is um, based, predicated on the assumption that Pell Care are already in the room. And someone's asked a fantastic question, which is, what, how do you even identify your team? Um, you know, this is someone with a, a rare cancer who sees various specialists in different places too. So how would you suggest someone like that who perhaps doesn't locate themselves in a very clearly identified team, how do yeah. they find the best people to talk to in the first place? Uh, it, it probably still comes down to conversation with their primary specialist. I guess yeah. the one that they identify as the leader of all that gaggle of doctors, uh, even better sometimes is to talk to their GP, um, who's yeah, a yeah. fabulous uh, organiser of medical care and sometimes has spent 20, 30, 40 years knowing that person and sometimes going back to the GP and saying, hey, I'm spread out like you know items on a table, but I'm not whole anymore. I don't have someone who wraps their arms around me medically. How do I get that? And GPs say, well, that's me. I do that. And But I will connect you with our local palliative care service, maybe who, who works in that part of the town or the city where you live. Or I know Joe Bloggs, who runs the palliative care service in the hospital that you're in um, and can make those connections. So I think it's still best through either the principal in hospital doctor or, or your GP. I think they're the best way. Nurses are fabulous and nurses are scary. And when nurses are grumpy, <laughs> doctors do whatever they're told. <laughs> and so getting nurses to advocate for you is very helpful. But in the end, the referral has to come from a doctor as a rule. Um, but nurses are your friend and they're really important. So one so, of the key suggestions is really about finding someone who can advocate for you strongly and and gathering some extra supports to help you find those people and start those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, um, well, you know, what sort of um, support is there for people who have disparate ideas? So, you know, someone who perhaps is ready to um, give up on treatment because they're tired, they're over it, and they would prefer quality of life perhaps over quantity of life but their families aren't ready to to let go of that idea yeah i think that's very difficult and it still comes down to communication doesn't it i think it still comes down to talking yes. and i think it's best to draw everyone together and try and conduct that conversation i guess not it doesn't have to be a doctor um, and there are really, really capable people within the palliative care team, for instance, social worker or the chaplain or psychologist um, or one of the nurses. It just needs to be someone who acts as a facilitator and, um, and helps the people who are resistant to treatment stopping express what that resistance is about. And often in the end, it's about love and it's about yeah. caring and you can help them maybe change the way they show their love. And I guess love's a word you don't hear said much in hospitals, but it's critical. And I think it needs to be spoken out aloud more often and recognize that sometimes the resistance is, is out of love and the, their perhaps misplaced way of showing it. And sometimes when you 
speak it in those terms, that resistance starts to diminish by, you know, we found a shared commonality, we love this person. So then if we recognize love as the basis for it, how do we move forward for the best result? I don't know. I guess that's the sort of way I'd be thinking is trying to, to draw them to a to a common point that we can work from. I think there's there's one last question, um, which is about is the conversation different when you're talking about um, perhaps that smaller part of your workload that you were talking about, which is getting people home to die and well, it's it's clear that that we're coming to the end of of that treatment or that medical journey, and that um, we're moving into a different phase of care. How do you start that conversation, or is it a different kind of conversation, or an extension of what you've already done? Yeah, I think most of the time it's an extension. But hopefully, there's already a relationship in place. Um, sometimes there's not, and and we meet people who say, look, he's you know, Sharon, she's blood's in a terrible mess and she wants to go home and we're going to stop, you know, transfusions or whatever it might be, but she's going to go this afternoon. And so sometimes yeah. that's the first time we meet people. Um, I think usually there's an acknowledgement that the end of life is coming from it, all the parties at that point. And I think then it's trying to be practical about that. And part of that is addressing things like Joe mentioned about what will life like be like at home? What will I need? And what should I expect and what should I worry about? And so things like saying, well, how do you look after people's biology? How do you deal with we and poo? It's what happens. And, and trying to think about the specifics that people have to be involved in sometimes is helpful. It's, um, I think you have to be a little bit more, um, well, I think things like you have to talk about what happens when someone dies and what will that be like and what do you do afterwards? And should you call the police? Do you get an ambulance? What do you do? So I think those practical issues have to be addressed as well. And, um, and really how many people is enough in a house to care for someone at that point and who needs to be around? All, yeah. all those sort of things need to be addressed. So conversation gets a bit more um, tied down in those things. The, the, the broader expanse of talking about the spiritual and emotional side of life can get a little bit smaller because suddenly it comes down to very much caring for someone's physical body and what you've got to do there. Thank you so much. You've raised some incredibly important issues and I think my alter ego as an occupational therapist sees a lot of this in terms of um, enabling people to go home and, and die in a place of their choice. So I'm glad that you've been able to be to be frank and practical and compassionate all at the same time. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph, and thank you, Jenny. I'm just aware of the time and um, wanting to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Carrie Lethborg. Uh, Dr. Carrie Lethborg is a cancer social worker and a leading expert in cancer care. Carrie has more than 30 years experience supporting people with cancer and their families. She's completed research in meaning-based coping, uh, palliative care, inequity in cancer care and the experience of cancer in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. She has held honorary research fellowships at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and the University of Melbourne and Monash Medical Centre. She currently works at St Vincent's Hospital Melbourne and the Centre for Rural Health, University of Tasmania, and provides support, staff support for a range of cancer organisations. So we welcome you, Carrie, and um, we'll hand the microphone over to you. Let me get my talk up. Here we are. Thank you, um, Evan. It's been really, I've sat through all of the speakers and um, I'm very happy that we will be, um, I think, 
uh, dovetailing into it, what each other has said um, happily. I want to first of all acknowledge, um, because I am in Launceston at the moment, um, the Palawa people um, from Lutruwita, the, um, Tasmania, and acknowledge um, any elders who might be um, online at the moment um, and uh, uh, all of their knowledge past and present. Um, one of the things that uh, Joe said was, um, I thought it would be the saddest day, but it wasn't. And that's part of what I want to talk about today. And that is how we live simultaneously with um, the incredible meaning that can happen um, when we have someone that we love who is facing um, cancer or that we're facing it ourselves. And how those two things can coexist and I guess how we can, how we manage um, to live with all of this. Um, I want to kind of go back to the start, if I can. Um, so there'll be people who are listening today who either uh, got their experience, their diagnosis of a blood cancer very recently or quite some time ago. Um, my first ever Award. Things I know about blood cancers is um, that the the phases can be difficult to kind of um, be quite specific about in your mind. But um, but I want to talk about I guess how this has changed you. And when I speak about um, a cancer experience, I always am talking to the person who has had the experience and their loved ones because I firmly believe that it impacts. Um, all of you um, as big if we could measure it um, but in different ways so I'm talking about the impact to all of you so um, I am doing more and more work around trauma and the impact of trauma in people's lives and started talking about the trauma of cancer quite a long time ago before trauma was really back in in the language and I did that because I've sat with so many people who have um, had a cancer diagnosis, who have developed um, needle phobia, who have been um, in despair emotionally, um, all of the things that come along with this experience. And I believe that they are traumatic. And I think if we talk about it in that way, maybe that's easier to think through what impact that's had on you. This is a quote, and I apologize for the, um, the quality of the, of the picture, but this is a quote by um, one of the foremost thinkers in trauma, um, Gabor Maté, and he says, trauma is not, isn't what happens to you, it's what happens inside you. So we may have right now 100 people um, online who have either had the experience of being told they have cancer or that someone they love have, has cancer, and they will all have had very different experience of, of what that was like. And the trauma can come at any phase of this experience, but it's not about the specific thing. So I worked with young women who have had a fam, a very, very big family history of breast cancer, and they then are diagnosed and they feel relieved because they're not hanging waiting. So one of the things that I never do is assume I know um, that that particular moment or the news was particularly traumatic. But what we do know is whatever those moments were for you, it's not about that they happen, it's about how it made you feel inside. So if you felt terror, if you felt fear, if you felt, I can't do this, whatever those experiences are, that's the trauma. And we need to be able to process some of that um, trauma because we go into shock. So. To, to give you a bit of an account of what generally happens. And everyone listening today will have had moments like this, that um, an adverse event happens. We get bad news or we see something terrible or we learn um, that something bad has happened. And usually we, be, we feel overwhelmed by it in the initial phases. Now, often we then calm and then we process and then we go, okay, we're gonna manage it A, B and C. But we have an adverse event and we have that terrible feeling of feeling overwhelmed and I can't do this. And then what invariably happens, especially when it's a very, very traumatic bit of news, 
is that our mind becomes really flooded with it and unconsciously we kind of stop feeling it halfway into it. So people will say that, you know, he said leukemia, he told me um, that I had a, a diagnosis of leukemia and I didn't hear anything after that. Or um, I remember getting this shock of whatever, the, whatever it was and it was terrible but then I just went numb and I got on with things and I made the phone calls and I did what I need to do. So this is a really clever thing that happens um, to human beings and it happens because it's too big for us to do. But what happens is that we do, we kind of freeze that part of us because we need to keep going. And the cost of it is, if you like a blown circuit, it's like we get our brain just gets so full and our heart gets so full of fear or worry and then it just blows um, and we become a bit frozen. Now again this is a really useful thing because it helps us get through and one of the th the crazy things about um, getting a cancer diagnosis is that you get a diagnosis and then you have to make big decisions and things get busy and you have to go into treatment and all of this stuff happens around you right when you are in shock and probably shouldn't make any decisions. So I'm going back to what would be the start for many of you because I think the experience of being in an advanced stage of cancer or having lots of symptoms um, happens when you have already gone through quite a big journey. And as I said, I'm talking about family as well. And then what tends to happen is we kind of go, okay, I just have to get through the day. I just have to focus on what I'm get, going to get through because I can't think about all that those worries because I've got to keep going, especially for other people. And, and there's a whole lot of um, messages that we get from everyone around us. And one of the really big ones, even if it's not said specifically for people who have got a cancer diagnosis or loved ones, is that you're not allowed to think negative thoughts. You've got to focus on being positive. You're not, you can't think it's, that it's not, the treatment's not going to work, which of course is one of the most craziest things in the world because you've just been given terrible news. Your life has been turned upside down and you're being told it's not okay to think about any bad thing to do with it. We know that it's much healthier to be able to face some of those things and talk them through. But I'm trying to build up this picture of what actually happens and you get put in this very difficult place. We get a sense generally I've got to be focused, we've got to be happy, we've got to focus on the, the good things. Um, and often what we find is that people who are living with um, a blood cancer and people that are very close to them really have very few places they can go to say, I'm scared, I don't know if I can keep doing this anymore, I don't know if I want the next treatment, whatever it is. We also hear often how horrible it is when people say, but you look really good. It almost takes that power away to, to say, do you know what? I might have done a whole lot of things to get myself together to leave the house today, but it doesn't mean I'm doing great. It doesn't mean that I feel great and I need permission to be able to be going through whatever I'm going through. This is a series of cards by um, a woman called emilymcdowell.com. You can look at them. Um, all of them are fantastic. And what this one says, please let me be the first to punch the next person who tells you everything happens for a reason. I'm sorry you're going through this. So the other thing that happens is that we hear all of these completely ridiculous things said to us um, to, again, um, just like Ralph was saying, usually coming from a loving place um, and a place that actually the subtext is, I don't want you to be not doing well. Um, and I want to give you some way of holding on to this, um, of what's happened to you because I'm finding it really hard. But this adds to the pressure. This is one of the, the big things that I think can be, is one of the saddest things. And one of the things that we often don't have the space to talk about. I miss the old me, I miss the happy me everything has changed. I'll never forget um, working with someone who just just come out of um, seeing her um, oncologist and had been told some bad news and, and, and I think it was she had a recurrence and she that we'd already gone through a whole lot of treatment but we really didn't think she was going to get a recurrence and she did and she said to me she walked out was clearly in shock 
And she said to me, it's like the sky is green and the grass is blue. Everything is turned upside down. And this feeling of the impact it's had on me as a person and who, how I see myself and who am I even now. Um, and I miss that idea that I could just be carefree and happy. This is context in which we then need to work out how do we keep living our best life. Fatigue um, is so enormous. It's, it's, we don't talk about it enough. We don't understand it enough. I don't think we prepare people enough for it. And uh, I, I have a cousin who's very unwell with um, cancer at the moment. And she said to me, you know, if you told me at the start, one of the worst things is going to be fatigue, I would have gone, oh, that's fine. I can cope with that. Um, and she's had a whole lot of other symptoms, but for, for her, that feeling of, I just can't even get my legs up to go up the stairs and I feel so flat by it, um, is a really big part of it. And of course, our, we have other things that we usually keep need to keep doing in our lives. So fatigue is a really big one. And, and what we know is like most of the things I'm talking about here and that the other speakers have talked about is that we actually have some good ways of managing these things. And um, it's important to be able to say, this is my top three things that are, are happening at the moment and I need some help with them. I'm fatigued, there's issues in my marriage um, and I haven't been able to sleep. You know, take those things and go, how are we gonna manage those? This is a quote from um, someone about their experience of diagnosis. I'm just moving something on my screen. Um, I felt angry and then hopeless and then panicked. And then I think I was depressed. I had trouble eating and sleeping. It was like an emotional so many in my head. What about this person? What about that person? What about me? Um, you can see in this person's um, quote, and like many of you listening will go, yeah, I know how all that feels, that it's like everything just pours in at once. And of course, the experience of a cancer diagnosis and treatment is that it's not like you've had a car accident and you have a big thing to process and deal with and then you get on with your life. You, you get these hits and then things go well and then it come, another hit comes and then things go well and then, you know, whatever's happening. And, you know, guess what? Life happens around you as well. Things like pandemics that stop you from uh, doing the things that normally would help you manage. Um, it is a, a, it's a torrent. Of, um, of things. Um, I won't go through all of these um, very much, but I, I really feel it's important to just acknowledge um, that one of the things we often don't talk about, and yet they can be the really big impacts on a person, is the impact that it has on, on, um, on relationships. So we know that in a family, as I've said, and I use the term family quite loosely here, I'm mm -hmm. talking about whoever your tribe is the people that are important to you, um, that cancer comes in and it just knocks that whole group of people in different ways. Some of them will um, look like they're just getting on with their lives but not want to talk about it. Some will fall in a heap. Some will be really supportive but cry at night. We know that it comes into a family and we really need to be I believe, uh, caring for a whole family. So when we talk about what's the plan here from um, at the hospital point of view, I, I would love one day to see that we go, let's go through the whole family and see what everyone needs. We know that partners, so I certainly know of some partners who have not been supportive, but I know so many who have been incredibly supportive. We know that there's been a lot of research done on this and that partners, have the same level and in some cases a higher level of stress than the person who has cancer. And yet we tend to not say, what do you need? And this is how you support someone. And this is some of the tricks that you might need to do to get through. We know that children um, who have someone in their lives uh, with cancer uh, usually pick up what's going on and if they haven't been told exactly what's going on they will fill in the gaps with their beautiful imaginations and it will be worse than we could have told them. We know children um, cope really fine with big news if it's age appropriate and if it's followed up with a very strong statement that their world will not fall apart. Even if the worst thing happens, whatever that is, 
there is still going to be this person and this person and this person and if footy is still going to happen if that's what's really important to you and this is a lot of information and so what we want you to know is that we are open to questions anytime there's no bad questions um but what we do know and i've spent a lot of time working with children uh, working with adults who were children who when they their parents um were very unwell and we know it has a long-term impact if we assume that they're just fine and they don't need to be part of it um we know that there is a big impact on the people um around you in your life and that they will all respond quite differently and we know that it has a big impact on how you see yourself um, and who you are and how important you see yourself as and all of those things. It has um, an impact on all of them. This is another one of Emily's cards and uh, it says, I'm really sorry I haven't been in touch. I didn't know what to say. Um, when I do uh, sessions with big auditoriums of people with cancer and I ask them to put their hands up if, any, if, if there's been anyone in their life that without a there be something like a cancer diagnosis and they weren't there, nearly everyone puts their hand up. And I want to say that to you so you don't think that it just happened to you. It is really common. And of course, the other common thing is that people um, find others that were have been incredibly supportive and they had no idea that they would be. It's one of the things that happens. It's one of the griefs that happens. It's important that we acknowledge and we talk about it. And um, I think the last thing I want to say about this, the impact is that there is a real sense that that you can feel like you are other to everyone else. This is happening to you and everyone else is getting on with their lives. So this is a quote I'll read you a lot of words on here. Um, Chris and I attended an anniversary brunch about two weeks after my latest treatment hadn't worked. And I sat there thinking how different I was from everyone else there. I was sick, I wasn't sure of a future I had. Uh, I had to endure suffering and I hate, hated everyone else for the good life that they had. I've become very impatient over the years. How other people, um, with other people and their complaints, how dare they complain to me? I usually get over it and become my old supportive self. I wanna be the one that's there for family and friends. I hate always being on the receiving end. Sometimes I feel so inadequate and yet I know how much I'm loved and how lucky I am. Um, I like this quote for a few reasons. One, that it names how you can feel so different and so alone to everyone else. But I also think that it, it, it captures the fact that you can feel both overwhelmed and down and really happy about how loved you feel. It's that dual um, experience but it's, it's important to acknowledge this. So the process that you go through when you have any major life transition and we are getting answers versus something else and hasn't worked, whatever it is, is a pretty big um, life transition. And the process is like crossing a bridge. And this painting is of a blind woman crossing a bridge, which is how I'm sure how it feels. Um, when you are in on that trajectory of what is happening with your cancer. It's about going from life that you knew, what you understood about the world, who you thought were your friends, um, who you didn't realize loved you as much as they did, um, what your job was, how you saw yourself, all of that stuff, what your plans were. And suddenly it's all turned upside down and there's a process of going across this bridge to what life is like at a different phase. And um, being in the middle of this bridge is a really uncomfortable place to be. That uncertainty um, goes against all the things that we know in terms of coping um, with life as a human being. Um, and of course, that's one of the really hard things about this bridge is that we don't know what's on the end of it. And I can tell you that this is one of the areas where us as healthcare professionals um, can often feel um, that it's as difficult um, to answer the question as it is to ask it. What is, what's gonna happen? How long is this gonna take? Is this treatment gonna finish? When will I know? There are no straight answers for that. Um, we have a bits that we can tell you, but um, we can't give you those um, answers to these unanswerable questions. And you can't necessarily think that that's an okay thing, that it's easy to live with. 
And so what comes from this is anxiety. Anxiety girl here is able to jump to the worst conclusion in a single, in a single bound. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about living with anxiety and living with um, distress as how we can manage to continue to balance um, these tricky things. Oh, and I just want to point out that we know anxiety and we know depressive symptoms are um, more prevalent in people with cancer and people who care for people with cancer than the general population. Um, but that does not mean that uh, you have now gone into a place where you have a mental health, a mental illness. It means that you are a very normal person under an extraordinary circumstance that would throw anyone. And acknowledging it, this emotional distress can be really difficult for some, and it can feel like a failure if you're someone who's always managed everything and you haven't had the experience of a panic attack before or, um, days when you're finding it hard to get off the couch, you can go, wow, who am I now? Who you are is who you've always been, but you're facing extraordinary circumstance. And so again, it's really important to just acknowledge it. This is one of the many symptoms that we need to just acknowledge and talk to and ask for help with. Um, and again, we know what to do about these things. So I just wanted to point that out. So I'm going to talk a bit about anxiety and despair and maybe how we can manage them. So anxiety is uncertainty, which is um, absolutely one of the definitions of living with a cancer, I think, times powerlessness. So it can feel like, well, I've been told I have cancer um, or I've been told that I have advanced um, disease and um, and no one's going to change that at the moment. I, that's what I'm living with. Um, I can feel totally powerless. What is important to do is to work out what bits I can take back. This is a quote by Andre Dubas. It was written a long time ago, but it's really pertinent, I think. He says, it is not hard to live through a day if you can live through a moment. Despair imagine, which pretends that there is a future and insists on predicting millions of moments, thousands of days, and so drains you that you cannot live in the moment at hand. So um, the really simple answer, not easy to do, of how we deal with a lot of stress and anxiety around uncertainty is that we focus on what we feel we can be sure about. We bring it right back to right now and we focus on today. This takes practice when you're full of anxiety. But what we know in regards to what the situation is, is that if we spend our time worrying about what might happen in the future um, or what's happened up until now, then we miss out on living in right now. Now, there are some days where I might need to say to you, um, do you think you can get through to lunchtime? Can you make one goal and can you tell me that you'd be okay until lunchtime today? And then it might be, what are we going to plan for the second half of the day? So sometimes our, the anxiety is so big, it's about let's, let's pull things right back to now. Yes, I can manage this. And then it might be that you feel, I can't um, think about the next five months. But maybe I'm seeing um, the haematologist for um, another blood test to see how things are going in two weeks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus very hard on not thinking past those two weeks. Now, this is not about denial. It's about not allowing yourself to go so far ahead that your imagination is building up all these concerning things. It's about what is important right now. Many will say this, be here now, it sounds so easy. It's not easy, but I can tell you that regardless of whether you're living with cancer or not, this is one of the great truths of the world of and how enjoy life right now. Um, so I can tell you at the moment, all of the, um, uh, all the blossoms have just come out in our street. And one of the things I try very hard to do is to notice things 
even if I'm rushing around and I've got lots of things going on, that I actually stop and go, that tree is incredibly beautiful. Now, these things all add up to make our lives meaningful, um, but we can be very distracted and not notice those things. The next thing I want to go through with you really, really quickly, and it's only, if anything, it's to say, if you think this might be helpful, um, look up um, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, CBT. There's lots of stuff online, lots of ways of, of working through it. Um, so it's really just me doing a little snippet of it. But um, one of the ways to manage <clears throat> when our minds just go into overload and we start worrying about the worst possible thing is to understand that the way that the thoughts that we have actually flow on to how we feel and that we can change some of those thoughts so that we feel differently. I'm going to give you an example. Again, this um, cartoon is a bit fuzzy, but the words that I'm going to put into it aren't. So let me give you an example. So here's the trigger. You notice your shoulder hurts when you're reaching up to get something from a cupboard. Now, if I just put that up there and we had an audience of um, some people with cancer, some who aren't, some who are athletes, we would all have a different thought about what that meant to us. But let's go to one that I have certainly um, heard often said. Oh no, this is a complication of my cancer. I'm going to jump to the feeling and then come back to that. And so because of that thought, I'm now anxious. I'm starting to breathe fast. My heart rate's going up. I might, I might have a bit of a headache. I might get snappy with people around me. And one of the things that happens is that we often skip the thought. We don't even acknowledge that that's happened. So we reach up to the cupboard, our shoulder hurts, and when we start feeling panicked because we eat, we, this is an automatic negative thought. It happens quite quickly and to a point where we don't necessarily challenge it because it just happens. So then this might happen. I'm now feeling anxious. I go to bed, I withdraw and I panic. And I might avoid going to the next appointment with the haematologist because this is all too scary. Let's look at ways we might go back through this. And we can do this over, um, over and over again until we start to have a different automatic thought. So the first is to challenge that thought. So say we've had the thought, oh no, this is a complication. Then we're feeling anxious, then we stop and we go, okay, hang on, what's just happened? I'm going to look at that thought. It's that it scared me about something to do with my cancer. I'm going to check it. So there are lots of reasons why my shoulder might be sore. I should address it um, and move on. So then I might bring in some coping strategies. I might have some breathing exercises that happen when, we, when I start to hyperventilate and I challenge the automatic negative thought. So I, I say, okay, it could be other things, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use some mild painkiller or heat pack. I'm going to monitor it for, I'm going to give myself whatever, two days, and then I'm not going to worry, but I, then if it's a concern, I might go and see my GP. So the reason why I'm putting this up here is because when things just feel like they're so out of control and I'm angry all the time or I'm sad all the time, these are some of the ways we can take back some of this control. So the, the points here about taking charge of these situations, stopping, taking some slow breaths. Um, when did I start to feel that way? What is the validity of what that thought was and what action can I take? All right. So that's dealing with anxiety, dealing with despair. Despair, there are many definitions, but this is one of them. Despair is suffering without meaning. Now, I did my PhD on this, so I could talk for hours and I want, I'm going to do a really quick snippet with you. So if you look at this um, purple model in the, in the, um, on the slide, I started um, this work by interviewing a whole lot of people with advanced cancer or at end stage. And I just asked them to tell me about their lives, their everyday lives, what happened on any given day. And what they talked about were these three areas. They talked about suffering. And I think all of us who are living in this world know that suffering is, is physical, it's emotional, it's psychological, it's spiritual. So anything, any of this stuff that happens around suffering. Um, then they would talk about 
moments of meaning. They would get a call from someone they hadn't heard it from for a long time, just saying, I'm thinking of you. And they would go, wow, I feel, gee, I'm so lucky. And then they talked about moments in their life when they were just coping. So let me give you a quick example to make that real. So we have someone who's having a lot of joint pain um, from their treatment and they wake up in the morning and it's been a number of hours since their pain medication. And so they feel that aching like crazy. So they're in suffering. Then their partner comes in and says, I'm going to give you some pain medication. And um, how about we go and you have a nice warm shower because that seems to loosen things up a bit. Um, let's get on with what we need to do. That's coping. That's the stuff we do to get, get through the day. And then a friend rings um, saying, you should see the blossoms in the street right now. Let's go for a walk. And I'm trying to keep this COVID normal. So it might be just going for a walk up the street, but let's go for a walk because it's beautiful. And I, I feel so lucky to have it. So what's happened with this person is they've moved through suffering, coping and meaning. And we do this constantly through the days. This was really important because we then measured a whole lot of this and we found some, some important things. I'm going to tell you what they are in one minute because I'm feeling like you guys have probably heard so much that we all need to do a bit of a stretch. I'm seriously going to stop. And if anyone who wants to stand up and have a stretch right now, it might help because we've been doing this from this medical stretch. Thank you. Now I just want to let you all know that I can see Ralph and he didn't stretch. Um, that's okay. I'm going to move on. <laughs> Anyway, I'm keeping going. Okay, so these are the three things and then we measured a whole lot of this. So the first thing that we found and we we did, I'm, I'm doing this by just showing photos, but I could show, show you multiple regression analyses and all sorts of data around it. But the first important part of this was the co coexistence of meaning and suffering. So we were able to show and other people have shown it um, as well that we can be in the midst of suffering in the worst case scenario of our lives and still be um, welcome someone who comes in and goes can i make you a cup of tea or when we see the blossoms outside the window we coexist in these places and the trick is to work on how can we have more meaning so that it rebalances because in the experience of um cancer we can sometimes just be focusing on the suffering but they can coexist we also found that meaning serves as a buffer against anxieties um, that accompany existence in general so so again more evidence that the more meaning we have it doesn't change the stuff going that but it buffers us against them so when i say to you think about the things that bring up joy and try and have more of them. Um, I'm telling you not that just to make you feel better. I'm telling you it will actually prevent you feeling overwhelmed by suffering. We also found that feeling that you matter and you belong is one of the biggest factors in reducing suffering and increasing meaning. So if I just explain that, one of the ways that we found was more important than any of the other things that happen in your life is that you f you feel like you are significant in the world. And so if that is missing and, and you're really struggling with that, then that's the thing to work on um, because we know that it's one of the biggest factors about um, reducing suffering and increasing meaning. Now, when I talk about things that are meaningful, I think it's really important to note, I'm not talking about the big life existential questions. I'm not talking about what is your purpose in life? What did you come here to do? What have you achieved? I'm talking about the pursuit of little meanings. And again, I could show you the figures we've actually, we can prove that this is really important. So it might be a fascination with nature, it might be doing what you love. So the feeling that this guy has, the thing you love might not be stage diving, but you can see the feeling. The, the those times when you go, gosh, this is what I love doing. I so love being in the garden, or I love sitting with my grandkids, or I love going for a bushwalk. 
those are the things I really love. I haven't done it for ages because I'm really busy or overwhelmed by life, but remembering those things that give you that joy. The wonder of play, it's no surprise to me that um, that um, play is things like colouring instances they are um, more important than ever these days. We know that still giving out kindness to other people can be meaningful and the simple beauty that's in the world. Connection with other people is crucial. So we started off with that triangle and then what happened was we then put this circle around it. We, we asked ourselves what holds people together while they're moving in and out of this and it is connection with other people, it is meaning in life and it's having managed physical symptoms. It's actually palliative care um, actually. But what this does is it tells you these are the things I need to make sure are really strong, that I have meaning in life, that I have connection to other people and that my physical symptoms are being dealt with. So I'm going to finish just with four slides here where I'm going to summarise some of that and I'm going to do it with the backdrop of some pictures from Tasmania where I live. Um, and it's actually part of what I mean. It's about noticing um, that we're part of a bigger world and that there is um, beauty to be seen everywhere. This is the Aurora Australis that we get down here in Tassie, which is quite magnificent to sit in. So one of the first things that I talked about was decide what time frame you can cope with at any given time. It will change depending on what's going on in your life and only focus on that. Okay, so can I manage today? Can I manage this week? Can I make a plan for two weeks time? Whatever I feel like and I'm going to work really hard at just focusing on now. This is the Cataract Gorge. If any of you have not been to Launceston um, and you come sometime, this is like walking distance from town so it's quite beautiful. Um, learn to challenge those automatic negative thoughts, those things that we go back to which is actually about our fear and um, that really hold us back. Um, this is on the East Coast. Identify what brings you meaning. List three things and you and have more of them, more of that in your life. We often forget those things. And this is the Northwest Coast near where I grew up. Allow yourself permission to not be brave sometimes. That's okay as well. We don't only have to focus on the meaning because courage does not always roar Sometimes it is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. And that is what we're all doing. We're just working out how do we get through the day each day and how do we um, at the end of the day say, you know what, I did my best and I'm going to try again tomorrow. And that's it. <laughs> Let me close that. Thank you, Carrie. Some valuable information. <laughs> said there so thank you for coming and sharing that with us and I'll just hand over to Jenny um, with some questions from the chat. Are you on mute? Yes. <laughs> oh Carrie thank you so much what a glorious life lessons are bundled up in all of that for all of us. I think one of the strongest things that came through from the comments was a deep and heartfelt thank you for acknowledging that the negative thoughts exist and that they have value and that, you know, um, it's good to not quietly ignore them, but just tip it out, unpack it and, and somehow work out how to reshape it and take it a little bit at a time. Um, I think one of the questions um, that I wanted to ask, and I think that you you've expounded on this quite well is is how do you remind people to keep focusing on that meaning and purpose when they feel like they're in that vortex of those negative thoughts and those things that you've talked about you've given some great strategies but what is there one first place to start um, that helps arrest that fall mm. Thank you for that. And I do realise the time, so it is okay if we need to uh, close things down. Um, so the first thing I would say is that I, I always start with hearing the suffering that's happening, hearing that pain and not just trying to push it aside. So 
um, acknowledging that that needs to be talked about. I'm so, you know, I'm, I haven't slept every night's really hard, whatever it is. Um, so acknowledging that's important. And then um, sometimes for some people, the, the concept of what's meaningful in their lives, um, you know, we we so easily forget it. And so some of the questions might be, you know, can you tell me a time when you felt just so much pure joy? Or when are you feeling, when do you just feel like you don't have to worry about something? Or um, what did you love to do when you were a child? Sometimes it needs to be actually unpacked. Um, but often they're kind of, when did you last feel really loved or happy? Um, and then a person might say, well, it was when I got a phone call from, you know, my friend, then it's about, okay, let's look at that. Um, what was it about the phone call? Can you see more of that friend? Um, or was it about that it took your mind off it? So I think it's really good to go back to that, a time when you felt like that. Um, for everyone, it's very different. And, um, and just acknowledging that you can have both because this, Focusing on meaning um, shouldn't ever be about kind of being Pollyanna and just saying, let's, yeah, that's terrible, but let's look at the happy things. It's not about that at all, but it's about when was the last time you did something for you and how can you actually make sure that that is a regular thing you're doing, um, even in the crazy busyness of being a carer or whatever. Thank you so much. I, I am conscious of the time too, but that's a beautiful summary. And I'm going to hand back to Mary Ann to, to tie up all this extraordinary information uh, and sharing that we've had. Yeah, th thanks, Jenny. Um, I'd like to actually take this opportunity to thank all the valuable speakers who've joined us here today. Um, Mrs. Jo Malone, um, of course, uh, Jennifer Phillip, who's had to leave, unfortunately, Ralph McConaughey and Carrie, Carrie Lethborg. Uh, it's been so insightful and just glancing at the chat, there's been a lot of action in that chat and, and I know that you've ignited a lot of um, a lot of thoughts for for patients and for their carers and their loved ones and you've you know you've addressed the raw and real and um, you know allowed us to step into how we can navigate better this space of palliative care um, how we can be more, more proactive in our own health care plan um, just some lovely sensitive suggestions about you know the importance of um, you know of of identifying what's valuable in our own lives following our own um, you know, our own um, values, finding meaning in what we choose for ourselves in how we spend time um, and, uh, you know, the importance of open conversations and reaching out to our treatment teams to ensure that we get what, what it is that we're needing. Um, so from all of us, the team here at Leukaemia Foundation, thank you very much for being a part of today's seminar.